Good evening, everyone. It looks like we have a small but distinguished group so far this evening. Um, thank you for joining us um, for this uh, important presentation from Kevin Baker with the Department of Health in Seminole County. Um, we are going to be recording this presentation, so if your staff or your colleagues are not able to view it, we'll be able to share it with you later on this evening. Um, we will try and keep you on mute throughout the presentation, but if you'd like to ask any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box, and then maybe towards the end of the presentation, um, if anybody would like to, to um, ask a question verbally for Kevin, we'll take you off mute, but that way we don't have a lot of background noise and dogs barking in my case. Um, while we go through the presentation so we don't interrupt Kevin. Um, with that being said, um, we're not taking attendance this evening. This is completely voluntary. Unless, Kevin, you need us to, to tra track who's attending. Is that something that's valuable to you? Uh, I would just say, if anything, maybe just the number of attendees would be sufficient. That we can easily do. We can definitely keep track of that. And with that, I'd like to introduce Kevin Baker with the uh, Department of Health. <laughs> thank you, Kevin, for joining us. Yes, uh, thank you all for having me here today. Um, I wanted to have this, uh, pr provide this presentation to everyone because uh, I'm not 100% sure that everyone really knows the role of the Department of Health um, and, and how we're here to help. Um, and so I want to make sure that everyone understands what the health department's role is to help you all um, as child care facilities um, to make sure that you have a health and safe, a healthy and safe environment, uh, you know, for your for your attendees and your staff. So I am going to try to share my screen and I've never done it from a, my laptop. I've always had a second screen. So hopefully that this uh, shows OK. So just let me know if you can see it. Let's see. So now, share, and share. Okay, can you see that? Okay. Yes, we can. All right, wonderful. Thanks. Okay, so let's get started. All righty, so uh, getting through the boring but important stuff. Um, so reporting requirements. So I'm here to talk about outbreaks and disease reporting with you all because that, that is the, the main reason that the epidemiology program, uh, which is the program I oversee, um, the, the main reason that we work with you all. And it's really to prevent the spread of diseases um, that can occur within your facilities. Uh, so per the chapter 65C, um, 22.004, which are the health-related requirements of the Florida Administrative Code for child care facilities, um, as well as the Florida Department of Children and Families um, Child Care Facility Handbook. Um, they mention specifically that children um, should be observed on a daily basis for signs of communicable diseases, um, and most importantly, that operators are required to notify the Florida Department of Health in Seminole County immediately upon any um, sus suspicion of an outbreak of communicable disease. So just the humanity part of this, you know, so why? Yeah, other than the, the, this just being a reporting requirement man man mandated by law, why do we do this? Um, and so I think we all can agree that, again, as I mentioned earlier, we, we really care about children's health and well-being. Uh, we want to make sure that they are in a safe environment uh, and that ultimately we're able to prevent the spread of diseases um, within the facilities, which can then unfortunately go out into the community if we don't get them under control as soon as possible. So I think we can all agree that that's really important. So what does this mean uh, for, for everyone here? Uh, so diseases can spread very easily in group settings uh, when you're in, you know, really really confined quarters with people, um, especially children. We know children love to, to touch and interact and, you know, and spread, spread all kinds of fun stuff. And so we know that's, that's bound to happen um, to some degree. So our goal with the health department is to stop any disease from trans being transmitted that's entered into the facility. And the, the real important thing that we want operators to understand is that we're your partner um, when it comes to outbreaks. So what we should be clear about is that I think you all, that most facilities that are regulated through Department of Children and Families knows that that, that is more so the regula regulatory authority. 
the Department of Health has no regulatory authority over facilities. So we're not the one to shut someone down or anything of that nature. Um, so in outbreak response, the health department is here to, to help you get the outbreak under control. If a disease is introduced into your facility through food or through a person coming in contagious, um, whatever the case may be, our job is not to point our fingers at you and say, you have a disease, this is bad. Like that's, that, that's not what we're all about. We are about, you got the disease, regardless, however that disease got into your facility, we are here to help you get it under control. So I know the health department tends to get a bad rap for whatever reason, historically, um, but I guarantee you um, working with us is going to be more beneficial um, than avoiding us or are, are feeling hesitant because we're here to help you. And one thing I like to be very clear about with outbreak investigations um, is that outbreak investigations are confidential um, and they're certainly not uncommon. Uh, so we don't, as soon as we get the name of your facility, we're not going to the news and saying, oh, by the way, this facility has an outbreak of norovirus. We, we don't do that. You know, outbreak investigations are confidential. If anything, we may, um, uh, you know, we'll work with the facility and we can't stop information from being spread. If a parent says something or a staff member says something, you know, that is kind of outside of our control. But we do everything within reason to say, hey, you know, again, this is normal. We see outbreaks of disease in facilities. Um, people are human. We interact. We spread diseases. But the, the most important part of it is that we're working to get this under control. Like that's the number one thing here. So that's why communication with us is essential because we're gonna work with you to ensure that this does get under control. So what are those outbreak reporting steps? So the first thing you're going to, going to want to do is create a line list. Um, and for those that are not familiar with the joys of a line list, um, it, they pretty much consist of listing out every single person that is sick in your facility. And when we say the line list to be, cre to be created for this, it's not just like, oh, this one person has a cough and then this one person has diarrhea. That's not really how it works. If you're doing a line list, it's because you think you have an outbreak of a certain disease in your facility. So let's say you have five people with diarrhea um, that just come up out of nowhere, then we probably need to go ahead and get those five people onto a line list. So we're capturing pretty basic information such as name, date of birth, the parents' contact information, uh, what class they're in, uh, when did their symptoms start and what were those symptoms? So that's like the, the I would say the, the meat and potatoes of what it is that we really need. Um, but you would, but what basically will happen is you'll get a copy of that line list template that will give you to complete. So you won't, you won't have to remember any of this information because it will be uh, at your fingertips. So that'll be the number one thing is you're like, huh, I'm seeing now I have a few people sick. Let me go ahead and start jotting down some information now. Um, that way I can give the health department a heads up that I'm seeing some transmission of something going on. Um, so that way we can go ahead and get involved. Um, so really, if there are two or more people in your facility that have the same symptoms, rash, respiratory, GI, um, I would just say go ahead and give us a call. Does two people necessarily mean it's going to be an outbreak? No, because sometimes it could be siblings and maybe they you know, got, came in contact with something outside of the facility. Um, that happens. Um, you know, so we're not necessarily saying that anytime you have two people sick, you know, sound the alarm like it's an outbreak because that, that's not what it is. Um, it really is just to say we're going to get the health department involved because if this is the start of an outbreak, let's go ahead and get everything under control now. Let's get all the control measures in place. Let's let the health department know so that way we can we can really nip this in the bud early. So the thing with outbreaks is that you are um, required to report those immediately to us. So within the epidemiology program, we have uh, someone on call 24-7, 365. So it doesn't matter if you get notified on Christmas, which I don't think any of you are open on Christmas anyway, but if you were, um, you could call us and let us know about the outbreak that you're experiencing or a concern that you have. 
and we'll be there to answer that. And we'll go over a little bit more of that process a little bit later. You're also required to notify your DCF representative, um, but for them, I don't believe they're, and I think Ida is here and can certainly speak on this as well, um, but uh, they, I did ask her and she said that it would be um, required to notify them by the next business day. Um, so that way they're also in the loop. So we do communicate very frequently with DCF when we deal with outbreaks. Again, it's not a punitive measure, but it's something for this, that way, you know, they're the regulatory authority. They certainly need to know, and we want to work side by side with them to make sure we get this under control. All right, so control measures. So these are some of the most common things that we recommend during pretty much any outbreak. So uh, what I read, and again, Ida may need to specify this um, if she has a moment, but I thought I read that the child care facilities are required to have an isolation room, um, but I'm not sure if that is necessarily the case. Um, but if there is an isolation room, the children or that are going to be excluded, if that are, that are sick, should be held in that isolation room until their parents are able to pick them up. Um, and so on that note, of course, exclude any ill attendees or staff immediately. Um, you should not be keeping anyone that's actively sick in your facility around other people. Uh, certainly the next best thing is to clean and disinfect. So uh, we don't know what it is and how difficult whatever the organism is that's causing people to get sick, how hard it is to kill. Um, so that's another good resource a health department can be for you all is to provide you with information on how to appropriately clean and disinfect. Uh, while we know that there are already some baseline cleaning and disinfection procedures that operators need to follow as part of being a facility, uh, that does not necessarily mean that it's gonna be effective in the in means of an outbreak because sometimes whatever is causing that outbreak may be harder to kill than whatever your current cleaning and disinfection protocols are, are would kill on a normal basis. Um, so it's very important um, that you're following the right cleaning and disinfection protocols. And we'll work with you to determine what those need to be. Uh, certainly provide a notification letter to staff and parents because we are all about transparency. Again, this is not a shame on the facility. This is not shame on a parent or a staff member or a child. Um, it is just to say, hey, we have this going on. We're doing what we need to do to get this under control. And the good thing about it is that we are able to provide that letter for you. So I know a lot of uh, operators are really good about communication with parents and they send out something and that is great. Uh, but we will provide something in addition to that with more information, more resources. Um, so that takes a little bit of that burden away from the child care facility operator to be a subject matter expert in every disease that could possibly occur. Because we don't expect you to be. We, it's great if you are. Um, we encourage that. Uh, but we are here to be those subject matter experts on your behalf. Um, another thing um, is halting group activities and dining. Um, I think the dining tends to usually happen within the classrooms anyway, from what I, my experience. So generally not too much of that, but um, if there are any dining situations in which classes come together, um, we would generally recommend that those stop. And then any group activity should come to a halt as well. Again, if classes come together for playground time or, or playing time or whatever the case may be. Uh, so very important to try to minimize contact between people outside of their classrooms. So that way we can make sure that if a disease is in one classroom, it doesn't hop over into other classrooms. So continuing on with this, um, I know what this can be a challenge, but we do talk a lot about not floating staff between classrooms. And we know on a day-to-day -day stuff happens, staff call out, people are on vacation or whatever the case may be. Um, but in the midst of an outbreak, uh, you really at all costs want to try to avoid floating staff. And that's because if you have a staff member that's contagious, that may not necessarily be symptomatic, they could cover, go and, you know, interact with children or other staff in those classrooms and spread the disease. Um, so it's extremely important to minimize any floating in the, in the midst of an outbreak and just really try to not do it at all, if, if at all possible. And then just our natural disease prevention, the most cost-effective things that we can do is discuss hand washing and cough etiquette. That's really going to stop the spread of the majority of diseases uh, that are out there. 
So uh, that can be done with, uh, with staff, you know, doing staff and services. This can be done with the children. Uh, we have an awesome little thing that you all may have heard of called Glow Germ, and you can put it on your hands and uh, you can do it under UV light and, you know, you can let someone try to wash it all off and then shine a UV light over it and you can, they can see how well or not so well they did with washing their hands. Um, and it's a, it's a cute and really fun activity that just really goes to show how important it is to have good, adequate hand washing. And then also with our cough etiquette, really, you know, making sure we're avoiding the coughing into our hands and coughing into our elbow or into a tissue. Um, so really making sure that, that your staff and attendees are uh, knowledgeable of those disease prevention measures. We also see to post in a visitation advisory at your entrances. And I know this probably comes off as, again, we're kind of putting our business out there. Um, but again, it's really just a measure to let people know, like, this is what's going on. We want to make sure you know um, we're trying to get this under control. Um, so your cooperation um, is, you know, is appreciated. Um, and then if things get really bad, and again, not necessarily speaking to how the facility is handling it, but sometimes these things are just very difficult to control. You may not, you know, you may feel like you're doing everything and then you're just stumped. You're like, you know what, I don't know what else to do. I'm doing everything I can. So now what? Well, we are more than happy to come out there with DCF and, and we'll do an assessment. We'll look around and, you know, we'll look at your cleaning and disinfection equipment, uh, either your supplies, we'll look at how you have things set up in the facility, and we can provide recommendations to your facility and say, hey, you know, these are the things you you want to work on um, and, and we'll, we'll help you get it under control. Because again, our job is, is outbreak control to get everything back to normal. Uh, that's all you're going to hear from DOH. Uh, we just work with DCF again because they're your regulatory authority. Um, and then lastly, one of the most common things we do is um, specimen collection. So that's always lots of fun talking with parents about collecting stool samples from their children or talking with staff about getting a stool sample. Um, or in, in the case of a respiratory illness, we may um, ask for like a, um, a nasal swab or, or, an or, or an oral or throat swab as well, um, which we can also coordinate for, for attendees as well as staff members. So those are the main things that we would be doing in terms of outbreaks. And the outbreak control measures vary a little bit depending on if it's you know, gastrointestinal like noro, or if it's flu and respiratory, or if it's rash. Uh, we actually just recently did an investigation of a cluster of rash illness, and I sent that information to Jennifer and Ida to push that out. Um, so uh, just for your awareness, there is, is a particular caterpillar, while, while there are many types of caterpillars that can cause a rash, but this white marked tussock moth caterpillar, um, we do see that can cause these rash illnesses. Um, so while we can't really test, you know, to say that, oh, this is it, uh, what we'll typically do in those instances is say, hey, can you take a photo? Like, do you have caterpillars on your playground equipment? Because that's usually the culprit. Yeah, like anytime I have a rash illness in an elementary school or a daycare, the first question I ask before even getting into like chicken pox and all those things is, do, is this caterpillar season? Do you have caterpillars on your equipment? And this most recent time we had that, yeah, we do. Can you take a quick photo of, the, of one of the caterpillars for us? Sure enough, it was that caterpillar. And um, so there are different things like that that we'll do. And in that instance, you, you have to get someone out there to help remove those caterpillars safely because not only are the caterpillars, um, can, can they cause problems with their hairs, which is what gets in the skin and causes that irritation. Those all have to be cleaned off. Um, and it, it takes a, a pretty decent effort if you have like a true infestation on your playground equipment. Um, so we ha did have to work with the facility to, to get that under control with, um, for their students. So just, you know, something to think about. Uh, we have all different kinds of measures. So that's why, again, we don't, we don't expect you all to have the answers and to know everything because it's a lot to remember. Um, I've been doing this for about a decade now. So I've, I've just, I've had I've my run through with just about most of the common situations. Um, so we're here to help provide that guidance to you all. So to co cover a little bit more on cleaning and disinfection, because this part is so integral, um, for non-foodborne related outbreaks, um, especially a lot of the person-to-person -person stuff is you have to be 
good on your cleaning. Like this is where like you cannot slack at all because I have dealt with so many outbreaks where they went on longer because when we finally went out to the facility and really assessed, they were not cleaning appropriately or their um, their like their solution was not maybe was too diluted and then the, the chemical was not able to really kill what it was supposed to kill. Um, so it's extremely important that you're very, very vigilant about your cleaning and disinfection. And when I say disinfect, I mean disinfect everything that you can get your hands on is that that's going to be the best way of getting it under control. Your most common surfaces are what we call your fomites are your really high touch parts of the facility. So the tables and chairs, light switches, doorknobs, toys, diaper changing areas, shelves and cabinets, toilets, sinks and faucets, playground equipment. Um, I've even heard of facilities they would carry their, or they pull push their kids around in a wagon. They'd all get them in a big wagon and carry them around. So those types of things. Um, if your facility has a bus, um, that's another um, really significant area that some people aren't always thinking about because they're always so focused on the facility itself. But if you have other areas where, where you know, staff and attendees are congregating, then that those areas need to be disinfected as well. Um, so it's very important to make sure um, that when you're, especially if you have people across different classrooms using the same equipment. So that's why I put the picture of the playground here. We deal a lot with playgrounds. And uh, what'll happen is that this, you know, maybe this, you know, there's a couple of classrooms that maybe have one or two cases of GI illness, but they're still letting kids go out into the playground. And that's and not necessarily a bad thing, if, especially if you're not quite in the midst of an outbreak yet, but you need to be very conscientious about letting students who are actively ill play outside. Um, and number two, that if a classroom is coming in from playing outside and another classroom is going to go out there, that, that playground equipment really needs to be disinfected. And I mean, I don't think any of you have quite an elaborate playground set like this one. Um, hopefully it's within a reasonable amount of time to clean and disinfect, uh, but you really should focus on doing a good quality cleaning and disinfection of that playground equipment to really, you know, keep your keep your uh, attendees uh, safe from any diseases that could be lingering on that equipment. All right, so some additional recommendations. Um, so we are not doctors, we are not healthcare providers. Um, so what we do recommend is that um, is that the staff and attendees can be medically evaluated. Do they have to be? Um, that is ultimately up to the parent and up to the policies of the facility about when they'll be allowed back. Do they need a doctor's note or not? Um, but we do all we always just as part of Department of Health recommendations is you can always follow up with your healthcare provider. It never hurts just to check in, say, hey, this happened. Um, you know, my kid's sick. Uh, and they, you know, they may provide some additional recommendations to you as well. But we're not in, we're not, like I said, we're not clinicians and we don't know the particular situation of every child and staff member. So that's always going to be a blanket recommendation from us. Um, something that I think is super cool, um, in my opinion, but I'm also an infectious disease guy, um, but I think it's really cool to have someone that's really dedicated and a champion for outbreak control and infection prevention. This gives someone a little bit more power to help ensure that the right, rec the right measures are in place. And this is not just necessarily within an outbreak. This could be your routine cleaning and disinfection, you know, uh, and the different policies and procedures that your facility has um, to prevent getting to an outbreak situation. Um, so having, or having or this person could also be the person responsible for doing the outbreak reporting and filling out the line lists or, you know, so I know every, every facility has different resources, different numbers of staff, but again, just something to consider um, having someone responsible for that. So that way um, the reporting and all of the activities can happen swiftly because that person knows what needs to happen. Um, something else we also provide are in-services. Um, so we can provide those glow germ hand washing sessions for your attendees if you wanted. Um, we can go and talk to you all about caterpillars and the rashes they can cause. Norovirus, we can talk about flu. Shigella is another gastrointestinal illness um, caused by a bacteria that we do see uh, uh, transmitted in, in, in childcare settings. 
um, and even uh, meningitis is a big one. People get very up in arms about meningitis. Um, and we can provide information on that and what to do if someone is diagnosed with meningitis or has meningitis symptoms in the facility. So we're always more than happy to provide in services to you all. Um, you know, in the time of COVID, you know, we're more than happy to do more of these types of in services for you all if you if you want and desire them. Uh, but even once COVID is over and we're kind of back able to get out into your facilities, we can provide those on site to you all as well. Um, and then what I am the most excited about um, is our outbreak reporting toolkit. So this has been a pet project of mine uh, when I was working in a, a different county uh, and I brought it over here. Um, and I really want this to be your one-stop shop for outbreak reporting information. Um, so this is going to eventually, this is going to start off electronic and then for people that would like it, a paper copy, uh, we can work on trying to get that worked out for you all or, or just make it printable so you can print it out and maybe laminate it or whatever yourself. But this will cover what to do in gastrointestinal illness outbreaks, what to do for respiratory illness outbreaks, what to do for rash outbreaks. It'll give you all the line list templates that you need, how to clean, how to disinfect, how to report, what the phone numbers are. I mean, pretty much anything that you could need will be in that toolkit. Um, and it was one thing that I just noticed when I was working in the other county I was in was that, you know, again, it was this whole situation of, we didn't really know that it didn't seem that the childcare facilities really had the, the information they needed to empower themselves. Um, and so our job at Epi is to be that intermediary um, between outbreaks and yourselves. So this uh, packet that we are currently having reviewed right now, uh, we're about to finalize that and hopefully, fingers crossed, by next month it will be completed and ready for dissemination. So once that is ready, I will be sending that out through Ida and Jennifer as well, and then it'll also be posted up on our website. Um, and one thing we're hoping to include in that is digital versions of the line list. Um, because while I'm sure everyone here has pristine, legible handwriting, um, we have had, and then also with the faxes, um, just the quality that comes in through the fax, we deal a lot with, um, you know, it's really faint coming in or we can't read the writing because they're trying to squeeze, you know, so much into the, the little squares. So we're trying to get those electronically fillable. So all you have to do is type everything in. It's nice and clean and can just be faxed over. Um, so we're hoping that'll be a hugely helpful resource to all of you. Um, and then kind of, as I mentioned earlier, um, there does not need to be an outbreak for you to contact us. We are here to help you. We are here to educate. We're here to make sure that your facility has everything it needs to respond to an outbreak and to just do with outbreak prevention in general. Um, so please don't hesitate. Uh, don't wait till there's an outbreak or things are out of control to reach out to us because we're, we're here um, to help you out and be on the forefront of, of disease transmission. So uh, I think I went over most of this already with the outbreak reporting toolkit. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's pretty much everything. So uh, I got ahead of myself a little bit. So, all right. And that is actually it. So um, that's just my name and information. And then this is all of the phone numbers you need. These will all be put in the toolkit. But if you do not already have these numbers handy, I would strongly recommend that you go ahead and take these numbers down now um, for, um, for non-COVID. So like your norovirus, your flu, your rashes, um, we want those to come into the non-COVID line because this is our traditional epidemiology program line. Because COVID's a little out of control, if you didn't know, um, we have a separate COVID-19 hotline. Um, so we do, even though we deal with the non-COVID stuff at this number, we do want everything to come in through this COVID hotline uh, because we have separate processes that we're working on specifically with COVID-19. So if you could please just make sure that if it's COVID, it goes to 665-3000 option one, and then um, to 665-3243 for anything else that's not COVID. Um, you'll also see after hours, um, it's the same number as the COVID hotline. It's just after hours that goes to our answering service. Um, and then they'll get your, your um, report over to us. Um, just make note with the after hours that they're not DOH employees. 
so you um, you don't want to give any confidential information. So you wouldn't want to give like a child's name or date of birth or anything like that to them. You would literally just call and say, "Hey, my name is so and so from you know from this facility," or or you can just say, "I'm my name is so and so, and I'm calling from a childcare facility, and we have a, an outbreak of you know of norovirus or something," and and will and then they'll get that information over to us. And then make sure you have our confidential fax line here for all of your line list faxing. And then for any general non-confidential questions and consultations, you can email us at this email address below. And that's all I have. Kevin, can I jump in? There are a couple of questions that have come through the chat, so I'll ask those. But before we get there, I'm going to jump in um, and take privilege. We had been, Donna had given us the, epide the three epidemiologists direct line for the child care centers for COVID outbreaks in child care centers. Are those still okay for our child care centers to call to just make sure that we're getting, we, we had some misinformation that came um, from some of the hotline operators. And so Donna had suggested that we use those numbers. So we had distributed those. Is that still okay to do? If you can just share with me those numbers, I can verify that those are the right ones. Sure, I can. It's, um, yeah, I can touch base with you about that and make sure. It was just to make sure what was happening was sometimes it was a hotline person who would not recognize the, the um, child care setting challenges and so would kind of handle it as though it were a family case or something along those lines. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I can share those with you, but just so that the folks on the phone understand that as well, that you've got the hotline, but we did have those, those direct, I know those three telephone lines, the direct lines for, um, for you, I, you would think I've given it out enough that I could remember everybody's name, but I can't That's right now. Fine. Um, so in the chat box, we have the first question was, if all staff have been immunized from COVID, is it okay for us to move between classes? And this goes, I'm sure, back to the CDC guidelines and the bubble. If adults are immunized, but the children are not, what is the thought about moving staff from class to class? Yeah, so we're talking COVID specifically. Um, in that, in that mm -hmm. case, uh, we do not quarantine or recommend quarantine for anybody that is fully vaccinated. So that means either one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or two doses of Pfizer or Moderna. If the staff is not fully vaccinated, we would still recommend quarantine. Um, we, uh, we say that to be considered fully, you know, quote unquote, immunized, you have the full doses and then you've gone two weeks after your last dose. Um, and then after that point, we consider that that person is no longer um, as susceptible and they should have that ability to do so. Um, but, and this way, again, that would be more specific to a, to a COVID outbreak because we have a vaccine available. So there is a little bit more flexibility there. So the, 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 um, the non-floating is really kind of focusing on those situations in which like there, there's not like a vaccine to protect you kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So, so the CDC guidelines are now recommending that if you are vaccinated, you can have a teacher go from classroom to classroom. I just want to make sure. I would have to check and see if CDC has such a specific guideline. Um, okay. All I can say is that if a child in a classroom came down with COVID-19, we would not, if that, if that person had been two weeks since their completion dose of their COVID vaccine, we would not tell that person that they would need to quarantine. But I would need to check and okay. see if there's actual recommendations on floating, because that's pr a pretty specific measure. Right. So I think what this question came up when you were talking about um, norovirus and keeping kids in their bubble. And so we've been talking about that with um, with the COVID as well, is that if you have an outbreak um, in one classroom and that te those teachers have been in three different classrooms, then there can be a risk factor there. So that'd be great. We'll, we'll check on that and see if we can get that out to everybody as far as what the guidelines are right now if you've been vaccinated. Um, the other question was, do you know of any all natural approved disinfectant? 
Are there any disinfectants that would meet the, the sanitation guidelines that would be considered all natural? I would have to check. Um, we What we do is we, um, we refer everyone to the Environmental Protection Agency's list in, which is all of the disinfectants that are approved um, for disinfection against um, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID. Um, so uh, that'll mm -hmm. also be um, provided with the outbreak reporting toolkit. Um, so I have not, uh, I have not come across that, but there are a lot, like I think hundreds of disinfectants on that list. So we can provide that information to you all, but I do not know um, off the top of my head if any of those meet that claim. Okay. Thanks. Another question was if the play, do we need to disinfect playground equipment after it rains? If the rain, if the equipment is in the rain, is there a risk from rain being on the equipment? Are they saying in terms of rain being able to, to, you know, quote unquote, clean the equipment or that if there's issues of the rain itself causing a problem? Um, I think we were just talking about between groups of children. If you had a sick child playing on the playground, you had mentioned disinfecting before the next group came right. out. Um, but that's just when the question came up. I don't know if, yeah, so if, if you want to jump in. Yeah, like if it rained after a sick kid played on the equipment, we would still say that equipment needs to be disinfected. We would not say that the, the rain would be able to disinfect a surface. So we would still want that okay. disinfection to occur. Okay, so the rain doesn't wash off the germs. That, there we go. Thanks. Um, there was another comment that um, we've got parents that are saying they don't want their children to wear masks due to extended health concerns, wearing it all day, and other parents who want their child to wear masks all day. What is the recommendation with higher vaccinations in the community as far as wearing masks? So until we get to a point to where COVID's under control, because hey, we're, we're seeing increases in COVID right now, um, that even if people are vaccinated, they really should continue to wear their masks. Um, and that is not, I don't think that recommendation is going to go away in the immediate future because, like I said, we're on the increase now. Um, and uh, I think eventually once we have enough people immunized and there's enough protection in the community that that might change. Um, but for the current foreseeable future, um, I don't think masks are going to be going anywhere. Um, and if there is a health condition, then the you know, operator may need to consider getting a doctor's note that outlines that. Um, we, need, we need to kind of review what your policies are, or I, I don't know if DCF has any, any policies on any of that, uh, but we would say that, I mean, if they're trying to get out of wearing a mask and they re and due to a health condition, then I know that myself, I would want to see some kind of evidence or something from a healthcare professional that that makes that very clear with that evidence. So you are seeing an increase in COVID cases right now. So there, even though a lot of folks are getting vaccinated and thank you, I know you and Donna have shared with us all the, the different locations for vaccinations, all age groups, essentially 16 and up now are eligible for the vaccination. Correct. Is that correct? Yep, 16 so and up we've shared that. Okay. Um, someone asked about downloading the PowerPoint. We'll actually, we're recording this training. So we will post it and send it back out to everyone um, through one of our constant contacts. And Ida, I will share it with you so you can share it to anybody that's not on the coalition's list um, to just distribute this. There was another question regarding um, having a student in the child care center that has an older sibling that doesn't attend the school but has tested positive for COVID. Um, that the child that tested positive is quarantining, is being kept home, but do the students in the child care class, the siblings class, have to quarantine? Yes, yeah, so um, we get a lot of questions about contacts of contacts <laughs> of cases. Um, so we only yeah. deal with contacts of cases. So if you have child A that's in classroom A and they have COVID, and then sibling who is child B is in classroom B, as long as child B does not test positive or does not develop symptoms, then 
class B does not need to quarantine. Now, if okay. you know the child gets sick or for whatever reasons tested and is positive, then yes, anyone in that classroom that was in that six feet for 15 minutes of that child is going to have to quarantine. Um, but otherwise, if that child is perfectly healthy, does not test positive for COVID, then, and that's in child B, child B's classroom does not have to quarantine. As long as, long as the, the child A in classroom A had no direct interactions with class B. So that would be the only caveat there. As long as your classroom stay totally separated, then no, we don't, we don't, we don't quarantine contacts of contacts of cases. Okay, so I think based but Tanya on the on the statement that you've had here, it looks like the the child is is okay. There are two different schools, so the child that tested positive, that child's class is quarantining, and that child is quarantining. But the sibling may have to quarantine, but the rest of the class does not of the sibling. Okay, thank you. All right, and. Think. Let's see. Do we have anything else? I think we're okay, unless somebody needs to raise their hand or has another question. Kevin, thank you so much for all of the really valuable information and resources. Um, I know this has been a really challenging time for our child care centers, and they're working very hard to minimize the the exposure um, and keep their doors open, keep serving children and families, and doing the great work that they all do. So um, we all really appreciate your time and, and the resources of the health department. But thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. And don't worry about this PowerPoint because that outbreak reporting toolkit will be even more comprehensive than what's in this PowerPoint. So I would say the main thing to take now is make sure they have our, our correct phone numbers and I'll, I'll review the ones you send me. Um, but this is probably the most important slide. And then uh, but they can always contact us in the meantime while we're working to get that um, outbreak reporting toolkit completed and disseminated. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great evening. Thanks.